help us be edified and apply it to our lives and share it with others. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Amen. So, Job chapter 31 is a very interesting chapter, and what we're going to be talking about today is how to be a Job 31 husband. Now, many of you are familiar with uh, Proverbs 31 about how to be a virtuous woman, how to be a good wife. Go ahead and turn to Proverbs 31. We're going to look at that real quick. But the, the message is really geared toward the husbands this morning, but ladies, pay attention. That doesn't mean relax or fall asleep on me because maybe you need to take some notes and hold him accountable, okay? There's a good instruction in here. The Bible tells us how to be good husbands and how to be good wives, how to be good fathers and mothers, and today we're primarily focusing in on the husbands and the responsibility that they have. And Proverbs 31 is known for telling a, a wife and a mom how to be, but yet it starts out with an instruction to husbands as well. So I want you to keep a place in Job 31. We're going to be back and forth through that throughout the entire morning. That is our primary text. But right now in Proverbs chapter 31, find verse number 1. The Bible reads, The words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. What, my son? And what, the son of my womb? And what, the son of my vows? Give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. He starts out saying, hey, mama raised me and warned me about the type of woman that would destroy a man, that would destroy a king. And we're hearing a lot about this as we preach through Proverbs on Wednesday nights. We've been hearing about that strange woman, about the evil woman, the adulterous woman, and how much God warns against that. He says, hey, don't give your strength, don't give up the power that you have to a woman that would take it from you. Look at the next verse, verse number four. It is not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink. Now anywhere in the Bible the word wine is used, you have to discern by the context whether it's alcoholic juice or non-alcoholic juice. When it says strong drink here, it's clearly talking about alcoholic juice. It's saying don't be given to alcohol. Don't be given to strange women. These things will destroy your life. So the first principle we can see for a good husband, to become a good husband, first you have to be warned about drinking and strange women. And this is how Proverbs 31 starts out the instruction. Why is, are they warning against letting your heart go after these things? Look at verse number 5. Lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. He's saying that when you're drinking or when you're chasing the wrong type of women, you know, I mean, a single man trying to get a virtuous wife is the goal out of Proverbs, I believe. I believe that's a big help. But here he's saying, hey, son, look out for that type of woman that will take your heart away from the Lord. Hey, son, look out for the type of wine that will take your heart away from the Lord's law, because then you will pervert judgment. Listen, we should know the law of the Lord. We should establish His judgment in the gate. We should stand up and say, Thus saith the Lord, this is what God has told us to do, and not be ashamed of it. Right. But yet, women and wine can cause you to do the wrong things. This is the warning. Look what he says in verse 6. Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish, and wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. This is talking about a near-death medicine. right? Somebody that's ready to die... Go ahead and give them some wine to put them out of their misery. Right? Look, wine in the Bible was a medicine. In the same way, people, they, they use heroin or pills. They use medicine to get high or drunk off pills. And again, that would go against the concept of the Bible. We're commanded to be sober. We're commanded to have a clear mind. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to judge righteously. Look at verse 7. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. Hey, when you drink, you're going to forget things. God's law, the misery. But guess what? The misery is still there. When you wake up in the morning, you still have the same problems. Go to verse number 10. Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. I said that for years of my life. I said, who can find a virtuous woman? Not me. Right? But thank God he finally gave me a virtuous woman. I finally found one because I tried to do it God's way. I quit looking in the wrong places. I quit looking in liberal churches hoping to find a conservative woman. It doesn't exist. You know, you don't go to some watered-down, wannabe Christian church and find a godly woman. They're not there. 
They're there for the fellowship and the rock show and the coffee shop and everything else. Go where the good women are and you'll get a good woman. Go where the bad women are and guess what? Be careful. You'll get one of those. Look, God wants us as, as single men, there's some of you in here, God wants you to have a virtuous woman. And men, that you already have a wife, your wife will be virtuous if you're the right type of husband. You cannot, as a man, say, well, my wife doesn't do this right. It's all her fault. Our problems are her fault. No, no, no. Hey, the buck stops with you, buddy. And look, to be a righteous a husband, you need to do the right things and then your wife will follow you. If you're always looking for a problem with your wife, then you need to go look in the mirror and say, the problem starts right here. I need to be that right type of husband and my wife will follow. She will get in lockstep. She will then begin to be that virtuous woman I want. Don't just blame, well, she's not that way, so I'm my way. No, 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 no. You be godly and your wife will follow. She will become virtuous if she's not. Verse number 11. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil hey that's what we all want as men is a woman we can trust that is so important a woman we know we can count on that's there for us that's going to build us up man a good wife is better than gold is what this is saying a good wife is one of the best things a man can have in life look at verse 12 she will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. If that's the kind of woman you want, then you need to start acting like a good man. Well, my wife doesn't have it in order. Hey, you need to get it in order, buddy. You need to get it right, and she, and pardon me, and she will follow. Go back to Job 31. Go back to Job 31. So there is instruction there in Proverbs 31, and we will get to that as we preach through the book of Proverbs on Wednesday night. And, you know, a good wife should be doing everything she can to help her husband. She should be supporting her husband, building him up, getting his back. And men, if you want your wife to be that type of woman, you better get her back. You better forgive her. You better love her. You better take care of her. You better teach her and instruct her in the right way. Job 31, look at the first verse. Job 31, 1. I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? What's he saying here? Hey, you got married, you made a covenant, a marriage. Why, man, would you look at a woman? Yet, lo, he says, a maid. He says, don't look at that. Look, your wife doesn't want you looking at other women. Yeah. That is not godly. Right. There's no, ex well, I just like watching this TV show. It's okay, we all take a look. No, 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 look. You have a wife, stop looking at other women. This is something that God's very serious about because you're letting that woman, that strange woman, steal your heart. Steal your mind. Steal your emotions. A man should not look at other women when he is married. And single men, let me just warn you now, don't make it a habit just to look at every woman out there. You need to be careful at what you look at. Otherwise, when you do get married, you've got bad habits you have to try to overcome. You don't want your wife wondering, is, does she have his heart? Do I need to dress like that to maintain his attention? Look, we need to avoid the whorish women, the women that dress in the attire of a harlot, whether you're single or married, and we need to teach our children the same thing. Yeah. We need to learn to hate the nakedness of the world. Look at verse number two here. For what portion of God is there from above, and what inheritance of the Almighty on high? What's he saying? Hey, what's God going to give you? How about a good wife? A righteous woman, a virtuous woman. Now, what kind of man is Job? Let's go back to Job chapter 1. I just want to lay some groundwork here. Job loves his wife. Job puts her as the, probably the number one person in the world, even above his children. Now, obviously, Job did not put his wife above God. Everything in order. Hey, you men need to put your wife, hey, God first, and then your wife, and then your children, and then yourself. You should not be selfish. And too, and too many men today put themselves first, and then maybe their boss, and then maybe their friends, and then maybe God, and then maybe their wife. Look, we got it all backwards. When God gives you a wife, that is an inheritance of the Lord. That is the number one person you're supposed to respect. You do not let your children get in between you and your wife. You do not let your mom and your dad or your family get in between you and your wife. If your brother or your best friend says, hey, your wife, boy, she's, hey, you need to shut your mouth. You need to watch your mouth. That is my wife. We are one flesh, and I'm going to defend her. Yeah. And if you have to fight your parents over your wife, you do it because she is first in your life. This is God's principle, and God wants us to be as men. He wants us to be like, I believe this, Job 31 man. 
that can, the characteristics and the traits we see here today can be applied to our life. So what type of man was Job? Look, bad times often reveal good character. And that's exactly what we see with Job. Look at Job chapter 1, verse number 1. The Bible reads, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. You understand that uh, to be a good man, you need to fear God. If you're afraid of God, you're not going to treat your wife the wrong way. If you are truly afraid of the judgment of God, you're going to treat your wife with respect, with love. You're going to honor her. You're going to cherish her. You're going to respect her and do all the things that a good husband ought to do. And today, too many men just don't have the fear of God. We know as we go through Proverbs, that's the error that everybody makes is they don't fear God enough to do the right thing. So here, Job, it was clear. Why did God brag on Job here when the devil comes to pick a fight? He can brag on Job. He says, God, Job is afraid of me. He eschews evil. He runs it off. I don't want to hear that bad talking. I don't want to see those wicked things. I don't want these bad people in my presence. Job was known for fearing God above man. And he rewarded him. Look at the next verse, Job 1, verse 2. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels, 500 yoke and of ox, 500 she asses, and a very great household, so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east. Hey, now that last, that last verse, many of us would say, boy, I'd love that. Well, I, want to know, I want to be known as the guy with the biggest house on the west side. And Well, I mean, we don't have uh, camels and sheep and oxen so much today, but I got three Lamborghinis and some Land Cruisers, and uh, you know, I, I, I got businesses and money, and I got retirement accounts. All of these things were given to Job because he was a righteous steward. He was afraid of God, so God said, now that I see your heart is right, I'm going to give you some resources so you will protect my people, right? And too many times we see the, oh, I want the, I want the promises. I want those fleshly, you know, uh, blessings, if you will. And we ignore the fear of the God. We ignore the spiritual blessings. But listen, God gave it to him because he could be trusted with it. Look at verse 4. And his sons went and feasted in their houses. Every one in his day. And Satan called their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And it was so. When the days of their feasting were gone about that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. Look, Job is interceding on behalf of his children. Job is praying for his children. Job is worried about the souls of other people. He wants to make sure they're spiritually right with God. And Job is blessed. He's got 10 kids. Man, wouldn't that be cool, right? I mean, Job had it all. And yet God allowed Satan to come in and attack. You know the story. Satan comes in, kills all 10 of his children, removes all of his riches just like that. The oxen are gone. The sheep are gone. The great house. Everything has disappeared. Job has nothing. Look how he responds. Go down to verse Chapter, verse 20, Job 1, 20. Then Job arose and rent his mantle, right? It means he ripped his jacket and shaved his head and fell down on the ground and worshipped. I lost everything. Did he curse God? No. He, Lord, thank you for what I do have. Thank you that I'm alive. Hey, thank you for my wife. I still have my wife. Look, he was thankful and worshiping God, afraid of God, not afraid of the enemy, not afraid of his sons being dead, not afraid of who stole his stuff. He's afraid of God. And again, God continues to bless him throughout this, this very difficult story. I mean, I often wonder, I mean, it's hard enough for us to attain riches, right? Feed me with food that's convenient for me. God only gives you what you can handle. And, and Job was blessed to have those things, but Job was spiritually strong enough not to let the things get in the way of his integrity. He was a righteous man. Look at verse 21. I love this statement. And said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. God, where's my mansion? Why did you take it? God, where's my children? I want those oxen back. I want my cars. Where's my riches? Where's my job? I need this stuff. No, Job worshiped God. He humbled himself. 
He said, you know what? I came into this world with nothing. I'm going back out of this world with nothing. The houses don't matter. The lives God can replace. The soul, he, the, his children were probably saved. He worshiped God. Hey, thank God they're in heaven. His wife was still there. He's probably thankful for that. He had the right attitude. He had a good spirit in difficult times. Yeah. And God blessed him. You know, hey, you ever seen a, a, a hearse with a U-Haul trailer behind it? You ever seen, and there, there are people that have been buried with their stuff. I want to be buried in my Lamborghini. What a fool. Yeah. How foolish. I got these things in my flesh. I got these riches. I want everybody to know that I had it. And a generation later, we've forgotten that person. Somebody else probably dug it up and stole the mirrors off of it. <laughs> Look at chapter 2. Look at Job chapter 2, verse number 7. So the devil continues attacking. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. In other words, like leprosy, a disease, hurting so bad, every part of his body hurting on fire with these sores. And it says in verse 8, And he took him and potsherd to scrape himself with all. And he sat down among the ashes. So what did Job, Job hurt so much, he's scraping his flesh to make it feel better. Do you ever get poison ivy or an ant bite and you just keep scratching it just to make it feel better? Can you imagine to the point you are opening your flesh with a broken jar just to make it feel a little better? Talk about pain. Talk about misery in the flesh. But hey, Job had integrity in his heart. He had, he, spiritually, he was a strong man. Look at verse, verse 9. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. Now look, his wife said something kind of stupid here. Let's be she, well, You're still going to live for God? God's obviously not blessed. Why? You're still going to go to church? You lost your job. You're still going to go soul winning? Curse God and die. Why don't you just give up? That's, but Job had a right attitude. His wife said something stupid. He still loved her. He rebukes her in the spirit of the Lord. He shows her what God would do. Look at the next verse, verse 10. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. Notice he didn't call her a fool. He didn't call his wife a fool. He said, You're talking like one of those foolish women. Look what else he says. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil? And all this did not Job sin with his lips. Job had the right attitude. Go to Ephesians chapter 5. Job still loved his wife. Even when he was at the worst point in his life, he hurt so bad he couldn't stand it. He didn't leave her in bad times. He didn't call her names. He rebuked her in love. I mean, he still instructed her God's view of things. Hey, God gives, God takes away. Shall we receive good? And hey, you know, it's like, but we had so much stuff before we moved. We had so much stuff before you started getting on fire for God. And now all the stuff's gone. Wife, I love you. God gives, God takes away. Wife, maybe God needs us to get stronger in the spirit. And he's pruning us like a branch. And he's breaking off some stuff out of our life so we can get stronger spiritually. Job had the right attitude. His character, his good character came out in this difficult time. And it, it shows his heart that he still loved God, that he had integrity. And this is the type of husband we ought to be. Now listen, there's probably, every husband in here is probably guilty of saying something to, the, to their wife they shouldn't. Maybe, maybe you've called your wife a fool. Maybe, well, you, I can't believe you said that. Oh, I, I'm going to get you right. Now look, Job at the worst point in his life had enough integrity and enough power of God's spirit in his life that he gently rebuked his wife. Hey, you're sounding like the foolish ladies. He didn't call her a fool. He didn't leave her. He didn't yell at her. You, know, you see what I'm saying? I mean, look, we can learn from Job. We ought to be husbands like Job was, and then God will bless us the ways that he, that he blessed Job. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. Find verse number 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Look, dad's in charge. The husband's in charge. Wife, obey your husband. Why? It's a picture of salvation. It's a picture of the church. Marriage gives us that picture. We as a church obey God. Look at the next verse. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ... So let the wives 
be to their own husbands in some things. Is that what it says? In the convenient things, in the things they like. It says in everything. Be subject to your husbands in everything. We need to obey God's word in everything. We as a church need to do what God said. He told us to go out soul winning. He told us to be disciples and make disciples. He told us to be righteous people in our everyday life. We need to obey these things and God will reward us. And look, he's instructing the wife here as the church. And look, those things go hand in hand. Christ is a righteous husband to the church, and therefore, because he's doing the right thing, the church falls in line, right? So man, when you start doing the right thing, she will follow behind you. She will get in place. Oh, I'm just feeling lazy. I'm not going out so oh, I'm just feeling, I'm not going to church. I, you know, I'm not reading my Bible. I'm just going to sit on YouTube and veg out a little bit. Well, she's going to follow you. Listen, husbands, you do the right thing. She will follow you in doing the right thing. Look at the next verse, verse 25. Here's a commandment. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Listen, men, as men, love is not something that's always easy, convenient, or often, right? And this is why God commands us. We have to make an effort to go out of our way to love our wife, to make sure she knows that we love her, you don't tell me I love you. I, sh I did, back when we got married. You don't remember that? Right before I gave you that ring, I told you I love you. Right? Women need to hear it every day. And men, we don't think about it like that. We don't see things like that. Well, you're still here. I mean, don't you know I love you? I, I, sure, I came back home today. I still love No, tell her you love her. They really do need to hear it. And your children are the same way. But he says here, love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Men, we need to lay our life down for our wife. We need to be willing to take a bullet for our wife. We need to stop being selfish and put her above us. Put, that's God's law. God first, wife second, and you're somewhere down here. There's other people in between there. And as men, we have a tendency, well, me first, and then we'll see about the rest. Depends on how the day goes. No, it ought to be every day, God first, my wife is second, your wife is the number one person on this earth to you. That's the type of husband we need to be. That's the picture that Christ gave us. Look at verse 26. That he might sanctify, I mean set apart, and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Look, your wife will be renewed if you will humble yourself and do the right thing. Your wife will follow you and be set apart when you set yourself apart. When you start to change things and help her and go out of your way to help her. Look, look at verse 27. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Listen to this, verse 28. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. Hey, that's the selfishness. Why don't, you, why don't you be selfish for your wife, for her sake? Why don't you have a desire for her needs, for her, her need to be known that, she, that she's loved? And men, put that first above your need to be fed. Right? Get that back scratch. Where's my shoes? Where's my clean clothes? Hey, make sure she loves you. Make sure that she knows that, 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 that she is loved. Christ did that for the church. He nourishes. He cherishes. That's the type of husbands we ought to be. Look at verse 30. For we are members of His body, of His flesh, and of His bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they two shall be one flesh. It's a team. You gotta love her more than you love yourself. And you gotta be sincere about it. You got, I mean, it, it comes from the heart. If you're faking it, your wife knows. They can sense that, hey, I, I, I love you, I, I put up with you. She knows what you're really saying. Your, your heart's gonna tell on you, right? Look at verse 32. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife 
even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Mama, it's your job to show some respect to dad. Listen, wives, you need to respect your husband, but husband, you need to love your wife. You need to make sure she knows it. Otherwise, she's not going to follow you. She's going to have a hard time doing the right thing when you're doing the wrong thing, when you're not being the man that you ought to be. Go back to Job 31. Go back to Job 31. Man, you got to be sincere. Cherish. To cherish something means you truly love it. To become one flesh. Hey, you cherish your own flesh enough to make sure you get the right thing. If you're yelling at your wife because you didn't get the food you wanted, you're cherishing your own flesh and you're hating your wife. That's not right. You know what I mean? Hey, when, when, when she makes dinner and she burns it, eat it anyway. Yep. Suck it up. Hey, in the South, we call that blackened. Yeah. Oh, baby, you it's Louisiana style tonight. All right, mama blackened it. Are you sure it's not too bad? I love it like that. Bring it on. You sure it's not too salty? No, it's great. <laughs> you know, Love your wife. Be concerned about her emotions. Amen. If you're the kind of guy that throws the dinner plate because you're not happy, you're a jerk, you're a punk, you're not right with God. Right. We need to humble ourselves as men. We need to lay down our life for our wife. They need that. They deserve that. That's what Christ did for the church. He says, two become one flesh. Jesus literally laid his life down for us, for the congregation. And now, hey, thank God for this congregation. Thank God for this church. He loves this church. And now to be a righteous church, hey, we need a righteous leader, and we have that righteous leader. Now it's up to us to do the right thing. Back to Job 31. Let's start back from the top, verse number 1. I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? Again, marriage is a covenant between one man, one woman, for life, it's before man and God, it's one spouse. And if you, well, I've already messed up, I'm divorced and remarried, that's okay. Stay married. Stay in that covenant. Don't break the covenant. You hear what God says now. Teach your children to honor and respect the covenant before God. And once you've made that covenant, keep your heart. Keep your thoughts. You should not be looking elsewhere. And that goes for the ladies as well. Well, you know, so-and-so sure has got it together. He owns a business. My husband, just he's just an employee. Hey, that's wrong. That's not right. That's not what God gave you. And husbands in the same way, you know, it's, it's funny because somebody was talking about this earlier. Oh, well, all, all the single men seem to be looking for this, this fairy tale, this unicorn. The women you see on the magazines are photoshopped. Hello. Even the videos you see, they are photoshopped. There is software to make people look different. They don't really look like that in real life. There is software that takes pounds off a person on video, and it's like, oh, well, that's what I'm looking for, and I want her to be able to have 10 kids and still look like that. I want her to wake up at 1 o'clock in the morning and have the perfect makeup, and look, hey, that's not right. That's not normal. That's not natural. Your desire should be for a godly woman, and hey, have somebody you're attracted to, and especially be attracted to their godliness. And man, when you find that virtuous woman, get a hold of her. Don't let go. Cherish her. Make sure that covenant is with your eyes as well. Right. Well, no, I've got the covenant. Can't you see? No, the covenant's deeper than that. The covenant's more than a piece of paper. It's where your heart is at, where your desire is at. Man, I thank God for my family. I thank God for my virtuous wife. And the things that she does for me, it's just, I'm blessed. I'm so blessed. And yet the world wants to use the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, and the devil wants to put something in front of a man to try to make him walk away from his family. Yeah. Be warned, men. God's giving us a good example of a good man who can honestly say, I succeeded. Who can honestly say, I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then would I think upon a maid? You're going to see things, don't think about it. Pray for your wife. Cast down those vain imaginations. Ask God to help your wife. Ask God to help you to love your wife. Ask God to help you to hate the whoredoms of the world and be a righteous man. And be a man with integrity. In Ecclesiastes 2, he says, The wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walketh in darkness. A fool's eyes, they're walking around. Oh, I like that card. Maybe I'll get me one of those. Ooh, I'm going to, hey, I like that. Hey, the wise man's eyes are in his head. Be thinking about the things that matter. In Proverbs 18, it says, Whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing, and obtaineth favor of the Lord. You men in here that are married, you have a wife that loves you, that wants to help you. You have favor in God's eyes. God has given you something that you probably don't deserve. Most of you rotten men out there, 
right? He's given you something that's better than you, and you need to love it. You need to hold on to it. You need to protect it. Whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing. It's favor from the Lord when he gives you a good wife. Look at the next verse, verse number two. For what portion is of God? Is there from above? And what inheritance of the Almighty from on high? What's he saying? The wife is from God. Proverbs 19 says the same thing. House and riches are inheritance of fathers, but a prudent wife is from the Lord. If you have that Proverbs 31 wife, if you have a wife that desires to do the right thing, that, that loves God and loves you, you got it. You've got something from God. You need to be thankful for it. Look at verse 3. Is not destruction to the wicked and a strange punishment to the workers of iniquity? What he's saying is God will punish you if you do the wrong thing to your wife. God will judge you and punish you if your heart is not right towards your wife. Verse 4. Doth not he see my ways and count all my steps? If I have walked with vanity or my foot hath hasted to deceit, let me be weighed in an even balance, that God may know mine integrity. Job isn't bragging how good of a man he is. Job is bragging what God has brought him through. Job is bragging on the promises of God and how he is righteous according to God's law because he kept his commandments. And Job is trying to tell others to do the same thing. He's bragging on God. He, he has his integrity because he did what God said. How did he do it? He had God's spirit. He was walking in the law. He was afraid of God's judgment. He said, therefore, if I've done wrong, judge me. I know God's law. I'm afraid of it. I'm trying to keep it. Therefore, he's able to have that integrity. And that ought to be the goal of uh, you as a husband. Men, your goal ought to be able to be said, when God judges the thoughts and the intents of my heart, I can come forth as gold. I will be righteous in his sight. Make sure your thoughts are pleasing unto the Lord. In Proverbs 15, he says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. He knows your thoughts. He knows, your, he knows what your wife doesn't know. And Job had integrity in this difficult time. Look at verse number 7. If my step hath turned out of the way, and mine heart walked after mine eyes, and if any blot hath cleaved, to my hands. What do you say? Hey, if my heart started desiring something that wasn't mine, if mine eyes were walking after some other woman, some other wife that wasn't mine, he's saying God's going to judge me. He's trying to be righteous about it. Psalm 101, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. Listen, another woman isn't necessarily wicked, but it's, if you're married and you're looking at it, that is wicked, right? Don't let your heart walk after wicked desires, harmful, evil things that will destroy your life. You need to hate that work. You need to hate it and quickly stop looking. Look at verse 8. Then let me sow and let another eat. Yea, let my offspring be rooted out. He's saying you're going to sow what you reap and we need to hate adultery for our own sake. If mine heart, verse 9, if mine heart have been deceived by a woman or if I have laid wait at my neighbor's door. All right, he's continuing out this thought. Look, where your mind goes, where your heart goes, you might as well have done the sin. Jesus said, you have heard that it is said by them of old, that thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whoso looketh upon a woman to lust after her, he hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Man, when you're lusting after another woman, you're already committing adultery. Women, when you're dressing inappropriately, you are committing adultery with that man that you caused to lust after you. That's a two-way street. Women, you need to keep what is yours and give for, only for your husband. Don't share your body with the world. Keep it for your husband, and your husband will keep his eyes for you. That's God's purpose, perfect balance. Look at verse number 10. If he had done these things, Job says, then let my wife grind unto another, and let others bow down upon her. For this is a heinous crime, yea, it is an iniquity to be punished by the judges. If you don't want evil on your house, then don't think evil thoughts. Don't lust after evil things. If you don't want your wife defiled by somebody else, then don't defile some other person in your mind. Keep your mind pure for the sake of God's blessing on your house. In 1 Corinthians 11, he says, For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. If we would take care of business when it comes, confronts us, and we keep a short account with God, then we won't be judged. 
If we judge ourselves, Lord, I'm sorry, help me fix this. God, help me not to have these thoughts. Lord, help me to overcome. Hebrews 13, he says, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Be sure your sin will find you out. Be sure that God will judge you. It will catch up with you. But he says, hey, that marriage is honorable. Single men, you want to find honor with God? You want to find favor with God? Find a godly, virtuous woman. And the only way you're going to find that is to try to be this righteous man, a Job 31 man, have some integrity. Do the right thing in God's eyes. Look at verse number 12. For it is a fire, talking about judgment here, it is a fire that consumeth to destruction and would root out all mine increase. Hey, adultery destroys families. And sometimes people don't appreciate something until it's gone. Sometimes men have a tendency to not appreciate their wife and they talk mean to their wife and they say stupid things to their wife and they look at other women and then when their wife leaves and they're, then they're distraught. Then they're heartbroken. Then they realize how much they loved her and how much they didn't tell her that they loved her. Look, man, you can avoid this. You can fix it now. Adultery destroys families. Don't, don't let your mind go down that path. Yeah. He shifts gears here and we see uh, the Job 31's the man's his character and his honesty in his household. Look at verse 13. If I did despise the cause of my manservant or my maidservant when they contended with me. Now, a manservant, maidservant, these are employees, right? Yep. He's saying, when my employees came to me and asked for help, when they said, hey, can I get a raise? If he despised them, if he had a bad attitude toward them, then again, this is something worthy of judgment. This Job 31 man had integrity in every aspect of his life. First with his wife, she comes first, right? With his children, he was praying for them. With his employees, right? He, or if you're a manager, you have, you have co-workers, you have people that are under you, you need to have this same attitude. Look what, he, look what he says in 14. What then shall I do when God riseth up? And when he visiteth, what shall I answer him? What he's saying is mercy comes to the merciful. And I will speak on behalf, I was a business owner for many years, and I tried to be merciful and kind to my employees. And then later in life, I find myself as an employee, and guess what? I found mercy from, from my employers. And I believe that's because I was the type of manager I wanted, and at the same time, when it was my turn to be an employee, I was the type of employee I would have wanted as a business owner. It's a two-way street. If you find yourself, I'm just a peon, I'm low man on the totem pole, you act like you own the place, you work like the type of worker you would want if you own the business. In the same way, as a manager, be the type of manager, be the type of boss you always wanted. Job is like the perfect boss. He took care of his people. He took care of business. He wasn't playing around. He didn't waste time. He didn't despise his employees. He had mercy on them. He had compassion. Look at verse 15. Did not he that made me in the womb make him? And did not one fashion us in the womb? Right, what he's saying is he's not a respecter of persons. Oh, but this guy, he's down here. Oh, his IQ must be like 120 or something. I'm all the way up here. That's why he's working for me. No, no, no. Job was humble enough to say, God made him. God made me. I didn't have anything when I came into the world. And I'm going to be a blessing to this person. Right? We're on the same level with God. Everybody's, I mean, God's not a respecter of persons and neither should we be. Don't elevate yourself. Don't be proud of where you're at in life and push somebody else down. Yeah. Be thankful for everybody. That, I mean, he's not a respecter of persons. You think about how Jesus, he gave the story in Matthew 18 about the servant that was forgiven of the 10,000 talents. He said, the servant therefore fell down and worshiped him saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence, and he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me all that thou owest. He was forgiven of a huge debt, and he wouldn't forgive somebody else. He was forgiven a hundred thousand dollars, and he goes and finds his co-worker that owes him ten bucks. I bought you lunch last week. Pay me now. What a jerk. What a bad heart. Look, men, we should not be this way. God has given us the opportunity to be a blessing to others, and we do it by having compassion and mercy for those that need help. Yeah. 
You know the rest of the story. Jesus said, Then his Lord, after he had called him, said unto them, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all the debt because thou desiredst me. Should not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? What happened? The guy was delivered unto the tormentors until he paid all. We as good men, as righteous husbands, we need to remember this story and have compassion on our wife. We need to have compassion on other people that may serve below us and have that sort of integrity that we're a good leader. Yeah. Next, we're going to look at how the Job 31 man's uh, compassion and mercy on others. Look at verse 16. If I have withheld from the poor from their desire, or have caused the eyes of the widow to fail, or have eaten my morsel myself alone, and the fatherless had not eaten thereof, all right, so the widows and the fatherless. Remember, these are the poor that we as Christians are commanded to help. Look at verse 18. He says, From my youth was I brought up with me, and as a father, and I have guided her from my mother's womb. He's talking about that manservant and that maidservant that he started with. I have compassion on these people. That, that, that widow needs help just like I did at one point in life. He treats them like they're his own children, he's saying. If I have seen any perish for want of clothing or any poor without covering. What he's saying is, I have helped the helpless. And as a Christian, that is something we ought to do. Look, that doesn't mean we help everybody. Flip back a couple chapters, go to Job 29. Too many times, and listen, I get phone calls every single week of people trying to get me to pay for their hotel room, people trying to buy them a tank of gas. Did you guys come to church? Look, we're supposed to help those that can't help themselves. I'm not supposed to, to help some dope head that doesn't want to work, that refuses to work, that refuses to take care of their family. I am not commanded to help them. And they want to try to use the Bible. I had, I had a homeless guy one time. Hey, man, you want to you wanna be blessed? <laughs> now, let me back up in this story a minute. My wife and I were eating lunch at the sub shop, and we see this homeless guy and his girlfriend go into the liquor store and come out with a gallon of something. I don't know what it was. Hard liquor of something. They put it in their little bicycles and they go on down the road. And I'm commenting to my wife, look, that's what alcohol does. If my children were old enough to understand it, I would say, look at that. Look at that. You want a drink? There's your future. You're there, there. Is that what you want? Right? I'm commenting on it. Look, I'm not just tearing them down. I'm saying, I'm tearing down alcohol. I'm rebuking the liquor that destroyed their life. They go on down the road. So we, oh, we need something. Let's go, we, let's go to the grocery store down the road. We go down the road, and guess what? There's that same guy. The same guy I just saw walk out with a, with a gallon of liquor. And he, hey, man, you want to be blessed? Do I want to be blessed? Oh, yeah, how are you going to do that? I, I can bless you. How are you going to bless me? Well, the Bible says that if you give to somebody, you'll be blessed. Now, at that point, when he started to use God's word and God's name in a way to get something for himself, when he was going against God's word, I got a little upset. Yeah. I rebuked him. Amen. I yelled at him. I'm standing there with a cart and my child, and this guy like, what in the world? And then here comes his old girlfriend. Oh, oh he's, he's on medicine. I'm sorry, he doesn't normally act like this. I said, the Bible says if a man doesn't work, he shouldn't eat. Right. God's curse is on your life for being a drunk and being on drugs and rejecting God's word. Why should I step in and say, oh, God bless you, take some of my money. And I see you out here, I saw him taking money from little old ladies and everything else. I rebuked him sharply. That's wicked. That's He's probably a father. He was probably a husband. But what happened? He let the drink get in way. He let the spirits of alcohol consume his desire. Right? Wine is not for you, son. You want to be a righteous man? Make sure that your priorities are right. So I didn't have a biblical responsibility to help that person. In fact, I think the opposite. I had a responsibility to rebuke him for taking advantage of people and lying to people and using God's name in vain. And that's what I did. Look, you're in Job 29. Look at verse number 12. Again, Job pleading his calls to his friends, telling them the way that they ought to be. He says, because I delivered the poor that cried, and the fatherless, and him that had none to help him, the blessing of him that was ready to perish came upon me, and I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. I helped the fatherless and those that couldn't help, somebody that couldn't even help themselves and nobody else was there. I helped the widow. The widow is singing because I was a blessing unto her. That's the way we ought to be. Go back to Job 31. 
Proverbs 31, the Proverbs 31 man ought to be, open thy mouth for the dumb in the calls, and such are as appointed unto destruction. In Proverbs 31, where he's preaching to that king, he says, open your mouth for the dumb, for those that can't speak, and are appointed unto destruction. You see somebody that can't defend themselves and their, their livelihood's being taken away, and you can do something about it, you stand up and protect them. Hey, you see some cops harassing somebody they shouldn't be? Some lady, some, hey, is there a reason you're messing with them? Uh, back up, sir, this is none of your business. Well, no, it is my business. What are you doing to her? What are you doing to them? You shouldn't be hurting people. You shouldn't be, well, we're going to talk to these kids and find out what kind of, no, 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 you don't, you're not allowed to talk to kids. Why don't you leave them alone? Why don't you go find the real bad guys? Right? <laughs> Get out of here. Look at verse 9. Open thy mouth. I'm sorry, this is in Proverbs 31, verse 9. Open thy mouth, judge righteously, and please the call, plead the calls of the poor and needy. I need to stand up and, and defend the fatherless, the widows, those that cannot defend themselves. If you're laid up in bed and you can't walk, you can't work, and your legs don't work, and your arms, you're in a full body cast, I'm going to defend you. I'm going to help you. I'm going to plead your calls. I'm going, to, I'm going to call the power company and say, look, I want to help this guy out. Will you give him some grace? Will you pay half his bill? I'll pay the other half. I'm going to plead your calls. I'm going to do what I can to help you. But if you're a bum, if you're a deadbeat that's my age, and you're able-bodied, and you refuse to take care of your family, and you refuse to provide, God's blessing is not on you. God's curse is on you. And Job knew that, and he took care of those that couldn't take care of themselves. Now, Job's heart was right when it came to money. This is very important. A Job 31 man needs to make sure that the pocketbook is not a priority over the wife, yeah. over God, over your employees, over your friends, or even the strangers. Look at verse 24. He's not greedy. Look at verse 24. If I have made gold my hope, or have said to the fine gold, thou art my confidence. Can you imagine that? I've got $100,000 in the bank. I'm good to go. No, how about I love God. That's my confidence. And if he gives me $100,000 in the bank, I'm going to use it for him. I'm going to take care of what he's told me to take care of. I'm going to take care of my family. I'm going to take care of my kids. I'm going to, I mean, Job had a 10, 10 kids. He probably had a lot of money and riches that just disappeared. And yet he said, my confidence wasn't in the riches. So when the riches disappeared, he did oh no, what am I going to do? God, why did you do this to me? No, he fell down and said, God, I still love you. Thank you for sparing my life. Hey, thank you for giving me a wife. He fell down and worshiped God because his confidence was not in the money that he lost. Look at verse 25. If I rejoiced because my wealth was great and because mine hand had gotten much, right? Look, it's because he wasn't rejoicing, that's why God gave him much. Verse 26. If I beheld the sun when it shined or the moon walking in brightness and my heart hath been secretly enticed, or my mouth has kiss, kissed my hand. What's he saying here? He's, saying, he's like gloating in life. I've got it all figured out. Oh, I'll, I'll worship the stars. No, Job honored the God that created him, the God of the Bible. And Job was greatly, greatly blessed. Look at verse 28. This also were an iniquity to be punished by the judge, for I should have denied the God that is above. He's saying, if I put my confidence in riches, or I worship the moon, Either way, I'm denying God, right? Hey, we don't deny God. Hey, God provides everything that you have. Everything that you have, down to the little toys that your little children have, God gave it to you. Down to the pennies that you save in the penny jar, God gave it to you. Don't gloat in what you have. Just commit it to God. Have the right heart about money and riches. Don't be greedy. Proverbs 11, it says, The liberal soul shall be made fat, and he that watereth shall be watered also himself. If you have a tendency to help other, hey man, let me spoil my let me spoil my wife. Let me help, let me buy my friend dinner just because because God's blessed me this week. I'm going to go out of my way and bless somebody else. God's going to continue to bless you. God says, "Ooh, I see what you did with what I gave you. You were liberal, right?" The New Testament talks about liberal distribution to the saints. That's the only time. Hey, I'm I'm liberal when it comes to helping people out. I'm liberal when it comes to buying you dinner. Right? But I, I'm conservative in the rest of my life. <laughs> Job had the right attitude. Job was a good man. Job didn't honor money above friends. He kept things in order. And therefore, God just kept giving him more blessings to give out. And even when it came to his enemies, uh-oh, now that's kind of hard. Hey, Jesus said, love your enemies, right? Now look, we hate God's enemies. 
I hate the God haters. I hate the workers of iniquity, the, the church of Satan and the devil worshipers and the Freemasons that want to hurt Christians. Hey, I hate them. Yeah. But I love my enemy. When I'm confronted with a problem, I'm supposed to love my enemy and do everything I can to have the humble heart that Christ had while he was on this earth. Christ could have pulled fire down from heaven and killed the Romans and the Jews that were trying to put him to death. But he laid, hey, don't put this to their charge. Think about Stephen did the same thing. Don't put this on their charge. That's hard to do. But look, if you want to be a Job 31 man, you got to do it. Look at the next verse, verse 29. If I rejoiced at the destruction of him that hated me, or lifted up myself when evil found him, neither have I suffered my mouth to sin by wishing a curse on his soul. He's saying, when, when it came down to it, and I'm getting all, oh, that's my enemy, God forgive me. I don't want to curse this man. Lord, you deal with it. You judge him. I'm just going to let it go. And sometimes as men, this is very important. This is huge. I had a guy yesterday, we're out sowing, I start talking to an old man, and his neighbor, I'm guessing it was his son, I don't know, they were part of some strange cult, probably SDA or JW, but they, he came over, I mean, got right up in my face, like ran up into my face, and then he's like, oh, well, the word hell comes from, a, and he starts saying some word, he doesn't even know what it means, like in Latin, or, you know, and hell doesn't last forever, and, this, and I'm like, look, you want to pick a fight? I'm out of here. I'm not out, I mean, soul winning is to save the lost. Yeah. It's not to argue with people. It's not to pick fights. If I wanted to, I could have tore him up. I could, oh, hey, I got you here. Let's go here. Let's go there. No, he wants to argue and fight and show his ignorance because he watched a YouTube video, because he listened to Ellen White or, you know, one of these Seventh-day Adventists or one of the, hey, forget it. It's not profitable. This guy wanted to be my enemy. I walked away, right? He wanted to pick a fight. Forget about it. And look, men, you need to defend your family. You need to, to if somebody picks a fight with your wife, you better get in between that. Right? Hey, they slap you, turn your cheek. They go to slap your wife, you better catch their hand in the air, right? <laughs> Look, we're commanded to be a steward over our wife and protect our wife and our children. Don't let somebody hurt them. You have an enemy that wants to smack you in the face to try to pick a fight? Take the smack. If I wanted to pick a fight with Brother Sear, and I said, come here, and I, and I slap him, and I did it again, he's not going to fight me. I can't fight him. Right? And that's the type of man, you know, true power is reserving your power and being in control of yourself. If I've got all this strength and this power and this might and I, I smack you and then you act like a fool and you go to jail, that's not power, that's weakness. And that's where the weakness in the flesh is, I wanna pick a fight, I wanna show you, I wanna show you the, no, 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 no. Be a man, take a smack every now and then, you let somebody think they got one up on you and you live to fight another day. You go home and take care of your family. You don't, and you let it go, Lord, Help me not to hate that guy. They hate me. Lord, you deal with them. Lord, if they're unrighteous and they need punishment, Lord, you deal with it. I'm not going to go cut their tires or do it. You know, I mean, think about it. Because men, we, we always want to get them back. Oh, I know what will get them. I had a guy tell me one time that he, that he put a hose in somebody's house when they went on vacation and turned it on just to show them. Hundreds of thousands of dollars of damage. What a fool. What a fool. I mean, if you, oh, I really got them. No, you didn't. God will judge you. You're going to pay for that. God will get you back. Just as we ought to defend the defenseless, God does as well. That's God's attitude. Look, the last thing here. He, the Job was an honest man. And if you want to be a Job 31 husband, honesty needs to be a primary virtue. It needs to be right at the top. And we do, as human beings, have a tendency to exaggerate. You know, I would, hey, look, stop exaggerating. Exaggerating is lying. We have a tendency to boast of our own selves and try to say things are more than they ought to. We need to think about ourselves very humbly when we think about it from God's view. Well, the way I see things, I really got it all figured out. Well, the way God sees things, I'm an idiot. I'm a fool. I'm a sinner. And I need his help. And that's the way we need to look at ourselves with some humility and be honest about where we're at in life and ask God to help us. Look at verse 33. 31, 33, if I covered my transgressions as Adam by hiding mine iniquity in my bosom. What's he saying? You know, they put on the aprons. They tried to cover their nakedness. They sinned and they tried to cover it up. Men, when you mess up, fess up. That's good. Right? Confess your faults. Confess your sin to God. He is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And then, hey, I hit the reset button. I, I got a clean slate now. Guess what? You're going to fall again. You're going to sin again. Be humble. Admit it. Fess up.
just fed, help, let's get through this. Let's get over this. Let's get past this. Lord, help me to grow spiritually so I don't keep falling to the desire of the flesh. Don't cover up your sin. Look at verse 34. Did I fear a great multitude or did the contempt of families terrify me that I kept silence and went not out the door? Now here he's talking about, can you imagine a multitude of people coming out in a, in a matter of judgment? Well, I know the answer that'll solve the problem. I'm, I'm just not going to speak up. Hey, you know what God says in His Word. You know that this is the authority over your life, this church, and every person out there, even if they don't want to admit it. You have been given the authority to speak up. You've been given the Bible. Don't be afraid to speak up. Don't keep silence when the truth needs to be spoken. Don't be afraid. Be honest. In Proverbs 29, it says, The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Yeah, but if there's a crowd out there and, and they're falsely accusing us, or even if they're righteous, is it true you won't let homos in your church? Yeah, pedophiles aren't welcome. There's a news crew out there. There's a, there's a riot. You need to go out and tell them the truth. Yeah. Well, if I go out there, they'll find out I'm one of them. They might call my ball. Hey, go out there and tell them the truth. That's right. Don't withhold. Don't keep silence. Stand up for what's right. You have nothing to fear. If the Lord is on your side, I have nothing to fear. What can man do unto me? I have nothing to fear if I'm doing what God called me to do, which is to speak up in truth. Yeah. We, need to, we need to preach the truth. Look, he also had a hard at work ethic. Look at verse 38. If my land cry against me, or that furrows likewise thereof complain, if I have eaten the fruits thereof without money, or have caused the owners thereof to lose their life. He's saying, I wasn't a thief. I'm working like I ought to. And look, there's a lot more we can, we can look at in Job. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to cut it off here, but I want you to get this point. And then I want you to read Job 31 for yourself. And I want you to recognize the type of man that he was. He had integrity. He worked hard. He was honest about things. He loved his wife. He was pure in his mind. He was praying for his children so that God would forgive them. He was interceding in prayer for other people. We need to defend the helpless. We need to speak up and judge things. We need to be judgmental. But it starts here. It starts with us saying, okay, I want to be a good husband. Therefore, I'm going to correct this. Then I can help others. I got to get this beam out of my own eye. Then I can help you with your little moat. Be honest. Don't be a thief. Fear God. Teach His law. Eschew evil. And God also can look down at you and say, hey, this is a good husband. This man is a good example of a godly husband. And that's what God said about Job. What a blessing. His wife was seriously blessed. And if you want your wife to have God's blessing, make sure it starts with your heart, men. Make sure it starts with your attitude. Make sure that she knows you sincerely love her. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for the example of Job. Lord, he was an awesome guy. He did a lot of things for you. You bragged on him. And Lord, I just pray you would help me to be a better husband. I pray that you would help all the men in here to recognize the characteristics of a Job 31 husband and apply them to their life. Lord, I pray you bless our time of fellowship and our soul winning today and keep our visitors safe as they go home. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.